Arizona Wildlife Views, brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Hello, I'm Jim Harkin, and welcome to another edition of Arizona Wildlife Views. On our show tonight, you'll meet a man dedicated to recording and preserving the songs of birds. Then we'll head up to the lakes along the Salt River and see what the Arizona Game and Fish Department is doing to help the largemouth bass population there. But first, we head up to the Grand Canyon and see the effects of one doozy of a man-made flood. March 5, 2008, had the earmarks of something big happening at Glen Canyon Dam. All matter of government officials and honored guests were there. The media was there. Even some curious feathered friends flew in to take a look. All were drawn to this remote corner of northeastern Arizona to watch the keepers of the dam try to recreate what nature had taken care of for centuries, flooding the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. No longer does the Colorado yield its greatest force against the rock, the power of floodwaters roaring down the canyon. And because of this, the canyon has changed, its wildlife has changed, the intricate tapestry of this remarkable ecosystem formed over millions of years, has been altered. The ecosystem had been altered so much that on this day, the third of what officials call a high flow experiment will take place. Secretary of the Interior, Dirk Kempthorne, head of the nation's principal conservation agency, will himself push the button to open the flood tubes from Glen Canyon Dam. Remember those ducks we showed you earlier enjoying the calm beauty of Glen Canyon? Well, here is how the flood looked to them. But don't worry, eventually they all flew away. Glen Canyon Dam, completed in 1963, forever changed the lower Colorado River, transforming it from a warm, muddy, unpredictable force of nature into a cooler, clearer, tightly controlled water delivery system. Without spring floods to flush the system and help rebuild beaches and fish habitat, native species suffered. The shift helped speed the extinction of four fish species and push two others, including the chub, to the edge. Well, I think that there's a certain amount of disturbance that the canyon depends upon. We've learned that through the various tests and studies that have been done over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And in addition, those beaches, of course, are important to the people that float the canyon. And from what I understand, the backwaters are potentially important to the endangered fish because they go into that warmer, quieter water uh, to rear the young. But native fish like the chub aren't the only fish in the Colorado. Non-native rainbow trout were introduced as a sport fish shortly after the dam closed its gates. Arizona Game and Fish continued to stock the trout population until they became self-sustaining, which meant they were spawning in the river on their own accord. Um, they continued that stocking program up until 1998, when the amount of wild spawn trout in the river were actually close to 100%. They were stocked into the upper reaches of the river, between the dam and Lee's Ferry, about a 15-mile stretch that has become one of the premier trout fishing destinations in the country. Worries that the artificial flood would negatively affect the trout seem to be unfounded. Steve Hamm and his group were on the river just two weeks after the flood. 
We were told about the release uh, at the dam before we came, but uh, we were told by the guides that uh, we had a good chance of still having some really good fishing, and that proved to be uh, absolutely true. It was just fabulous. It really crescendoed today for me. I, I caught 15 fish, my partner 16 fish. We probably had, uh, you know, 10, 10 to 12 long distance releases. The Arizona Game and Fish Department has been monitoring the trout since the early 1980s. They regularly spend several nights on the river to check on the condition of the fish. Part of our long-term monitoring up here is that we, we do electrofish um, the trout at the ferry. And what we're going to be doing is uh, kind of electrofishing for a piece of uh, a selected piece of habitat, for instance, a, a cobble bar. And we're going to net the fish, we're going to work them up, Rainbow. and we're also going to be tagging and weighing these fish. Three, four, one. So with hopes that we could get a better, better population estimates and better estimates of growth and et cetera. The electrofishing process allows the biologists to stun the fish long enough for them to complete their work and then they are released back into the river. Even though the process sounds harsh, it doesn't harm the fish. On our boats, we've got a generator, a 5,000 watt generator, and a magic box called a CPS, a complex pulse system electrofishing unit. And what that box does, is it takes the AC power from the generator and converts it into a pulsed DC electrofishing current. And we've got anodes off the front of the boat and cathodes off the back. So essentially what we have is one 16-foot electricity circuit. And when we do pass that in the water, it gets distributed throughout the water. And depending on your shoreline type and on, depending on the substrate, um, now the current gets bounced off the rocks, off the sand, and passes through the fish to where the point they become stunned, come up to the water, and where they're there for us to net. It will take about a month to completely analyze the data that Andy and his crew have gathered here tonight. But already, he is seeing some positive indicators. Well, we're kind of seeing similar results that, uh, without analyzing the data and kind of offhand, that look fairly similar to the results that we observed in, uh, before the flood in February. And what we're seeing with the fish is that they're looking fat and happy, um, real healthy looking. The controlled flood released 41,000 cubic feet per second of water for 60 hours, which scientists hope will be enough to create the desired effect of a natural spring flood. Of course, this release is being looked at and weighed and measured for much more than its possible effect on the rainbow trout fishery at Lee's Ferry. Today's test involves over 100 scientists along 225 miles of river. These scientists come not only from the USGS and other federal agencies, but from leading research uh, universities around the world. I am excited that the research that will take place in conjunction with the high flow test is being conducted using an ecosystems based approach. In order to understand the ecosystem, we must understand the linkage between physical processes, such as the movement of sand, and biological community that exists within the Grand Canyon. In 1992, Congress passed the Grand Canyon Protection Act, which ordered the Department of the Interior to manage the dam in a way that better protected resources. Four years later, the government staged the first artificial flood. A second high flow test was conducted in 2004. Since the original purpose of Glen Canyon Dam was water storage, hydroelectrical generation, and flood control, the agencies that are charged with these different areas are often at odds with one another. There's a somewhat of a continual tension between the work that the Bureau of Reclamation has to do in operating the facility and that the other federal agencies have relative to the downstream resources. As, as our commissioner said, Congress has established the Colorado River Storage Project and established Glen Canyon Dam and given us direction on what we're to do and the benefits we're to achieve. Downstream of the dam, Congress has also created Grand Canyon National Park. Congress has said we will do certain things to protect environmental values downstream. So there, there is a, a tension that continually is at play. And part of what we're trying to do through the adaptive management program is find some of that middle ground, find the ways that we can maintain and protect the benefit of the dam and maintain and protect the, the resources that are downstream. Glen Canyon Dam's mighty generators turn out 4.5 billion kilowatts of power for the Southwest every year. 
and Lake Powell, when full, can hold 27 million acre feet of water. The lake has also become a major recreation destination for visitors. But how the dam will be managed in the future, and should regular flooding at the Grand Canyon become part of its mission, is still not certain. It's a body of knowledge that's evolving continuously, and this is yet one more chapter of information. Where it goes from here in terms of the, the, the longer term future is, is an issue we're still working on. While the future of huge water releases from Glen Canyon Dam is still undecided, one thing's for sure, people's love of beauty and nature will never go away. In our next segment, we're going to meet a man who's saving little bits of wildlife for us, one song at a time. Well, right now I'm just looking around with the microphone. Uh, we're kind of surrounded by 15 or 20 different species. We have a Sais Phoebe off in the direction the mic's pointed now, singing its spring song, which is, it only does for uh, a few weeks out of the year. Well, I've been a birder forever, all my life, really. And I always knew that I was listening to the birds as much as I was watching them, and people were always surprised that I could hear and differentiate between the various birds I was hearing, and I realized that it was a talent that not everybody has. Now we have two birds that we're paying attention to. One is the Says Phoebe that's sitting right in the top of an old mulberry tree up here. You notice if we turn the mic away a little bit, how it cuts down on the volume of the call. If I hear a bird that I've only heard once four years ago in some other habitat, it'll take me exactly back to that habitat. I can remember where the bird was sitting and how he was, like a smell will do for, for a lot of people. House finches are really common bird everywhere in Arizona, everywhere in, this, in the country almost now. But they're pretty interesting in that they have very specific local dialects. He's got his own thing going on though, this guy. He's an innovator. I started getting interested in what these birds were talking about, what all the communication was about, and how they were communicating. And it always seemed more complex to me than the books made it out to be. You hear that squeaky little thing? Most complex bird song there is. I started to record birds thinking that if I did that, I could bring them back into the house and study them a little more carefully and maybe learn a little bit about what's going on. And what I found out was that it was 50 times as complex as I thought it was even then. When you look at the song of a marsh wren in a spectrogram on the computer screen, you can see words and phrases and punctuation in what he's doing, and you can see how he uses that punctuation. <laughs> Aircraft are really the bane of recordists' lives. They, they dominate the soundscape for miles around them. And now we've got one doing acrobatics right up above us here. <laughs> the problem these days is more that there is so much sound around you, so much human-generated sound, that most of the natural sound just gets blocked out. And you get used to um, filtering out most of what you hear all the time. When you go out in nature, I think it's real difficult to turn off that filter and, and start listening again. It even took me a while when I started doing this seriously to really pay attention to very faint sounds in the distance. And you kind of have to train yourself to do it. It's your natural inclination, like I'm now listening to the Anna's hummingbird behind me <laughs> as I'm supposed to be paying attention to you. The stuff that looks like grass here is another kind of a reed called Juncus mexicana. And it's populated by fishing spiders. They, aren't, they don't actually fish, but they're always right at the edge of the water here. The nice thing about nature recording is it's just a nice excuse for getting out and seeing all this interesting stuff every day. Yeah, it's a great time of year. Everybody's, everybody's singing. Everybody's trying to attract a mate, establish a territory. 
That's a Virginia rail right there. Did you hear that? It sounded like a pig, didn't it? <laughs> Lots of Virginia rails around this marshy area of the, of the lake and of course around Tavasi Marsh. Tavasi Marsh and Pex Lake are new members of the Tuzigut IBA, which is the latest and first state important bird area. And we're in the process of trying to ensure that this is all conserved for the future. Spectacular habitat for uh, over 200 species of birds. What is that? Cormorant, double crested cormorant. I'll be darned. I think that's a first for Pex Lake. This guy is lost. Like, where's my family? This red tail that's sitting up here is one I call Chewy. He's a young male. He's three years old. He was born, oh, <clears throat> about a mile over this direction. And this is Chewy's territory. He's got probably the most deluxe red tail hawk territory that there is. And he's aggressive and absolutely defends this territory of his. The Verde River, the the cause for the whole Verde Valley to be here and the reason that everybody lives here flows right by my house like a private little stretch of the river. And uh, it just means everything to me. This is, this is my whole life, all of this right around the house here. And I feel so lucky to have got this piece of property that my parents took such good care of for 28 years. They've been feeding birds here for 28 years and these guys have been coming back on migration for 28 years maybe 30 years now to this house, expecting to be fed. I feed them 10 pounds of food a day. <laughs> Let's go down and see if we can't get these uh, more hens singing away. They're trying to entertain us. We might as well take advantage of it. Look at that. Look at him walking on those lily pads. Is that beautiful? Give me one of those. It was great to hear the moorhens all calling and talking to each other and the, the male and the female chattering amongst themselves. And you get to feel like you're much more of a part of their world than you do as just an observer. Look, I have a beautiful white tail with two big flashes on it. She says so. I've seen better. <laughs> Talk for me. He's not got a really good territory, and he is not at the top of a tree displaying like an older male would be. He's just kind of practicing, seeing what he's got. The amount of information that's conveyed from one bird to his target, I think is very, very complex and very specific. Someday we're going to realize that there's much more going on out there, that these guys are much more complex than we think they are. This is Nature Songs, it's my website. It's in fact the busiest bird-related website on the internet today. It's certainly the largest natural sound site on the internet today. It gets 3,000 to 4,000 individual visitors a day. A lot of people interested in this kind of stuff. It's branched me out to where I started a, uh, a bulletin board, essentially, a listserv for recordists all over the world that now has 450 members from every corner of the world. That's a uh, pied-billed grebe. There's a lot of people write to me every day and say, geez, you know, you, your, your website's a treasure. I really love it. You know, it's opened up a whole new thing for me or whatever. And those are great letters to get, you know, because they say that it is whetting their appetite to to appreciate nature more than what they did before. And that's the point of everything I do, is to get people to appreciate it more. You know, to want to conserve it, to, to know that there's value in, in this stretch of quiet river and in this important bird area that goes up and down the Verde River and in, in Tavasi Marsh over here, that if we build 900 homes out there, it's gone forever. Your grandkids will never know what a marsh looked like. And we can afford that, you know, we can afford that one marsh and this one lake and a few other tracks like that here and there in Arizona, you know, we don't need houses everywhere. There's plenty of golf courses in Phoenix. That's my plea. Save us a little bit of this. I just love to listen to the birds sing. 
Hey, I also love to fish in Arizona's many lakes and reservoirs. Next, we head to Saguaro Lake, where the largemouth bass population is getting a little help from its friends. The reservoirs along the Salt River, known as Saguaro, Canyon, and Apache Lakes, were famous for their fine largemouth bass fishing. But a recent invader has been creating havoc with their fish populations. And a lot of times, a lot of the smaller fish will see a lot of shad die off. Uh, smallmouth bass are pretty susceptible to it. Uh, smaller largemouth bass are pretty susceptible to it. Um, in a way, it sort of suffocates them. And there's, there's really, because these reservoirs are so large, there's really no way to, to eradicate it. The nemesis is a microscopic, one-celled aquatic organism called Primnesium parvum, better known as golden algae. The Arizona Game and Fish Department is part of a multi-agency effort to examine and find ways to deal with the invasive species. Now, especially in a large reservoir like this, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to get rid of. Um, there are certain algicides that, that can get rid of it. It works in some of our um, urban ponds. But in a lake like this, it's so big, and it would take so much chemical, actually, to remove the golden algae. And it's likely going to come back that we can only kind of manage, manage it as it is. This truck is carrying about 150,000 largemouth bass fingerlings, which will be distributed between the three reservoirs in hopes of rebuilding the population. Um, last fall, we stocked about 13,000 six to eight inch largemouth bass. And we're gonna be doing that for the next year or two. Um, and it'll allow us to evaluate what, which is better, better. Is it better to stock uh, 150,000 smaller fish or you know, 10 to 15,000 bigger fish. Um, it's a way just to evaluate different stocking, stocking methods. The biologists will be able to differentiate between the groups of stocked fish by the way they are marked. For this stocking, they are trying a new method which will mark all 150,000 fish at once. Before we put them into the lake, we're gonna give them a chemical bath called oxytetracycline. And oxytetracycline is a fish antibiotic. It's used to help cure infections. The way it works, we don't use it to cure infections. We use it to uh, mark the fish, actually. And it's a way to mark a bunch of fish, um, like 150,000 fish at one time. Um, what it does is mix the chemical into the hauling truck, and uh, we bathe the fish in this, this uh, chemical bath for about six hours, and it incorporates into their skeletal tissue. And uh, later on, when we go out to do our surveys in the future, um, and we're catching fish, and uh, we'll be able to distinguish between the fish that we just stocked, that we're stocking today, and the fish that are um, naturally reproducing out there in the, in the lake. Arizona Game and Fish Department couldn't undertake a project like this without the help of its volunteer partners. The United Arizona Anglers Foundation has raised over $18,000, including a donation from Sportsman's Warehouse of $5,000, to help offset the cost of the fish. When we were approached on this and made aware of the, the uh, algae and the die-off in the three of the reservoirs out here, uh, uh, got together with all the stores in Arizona and uh, was able to come up uh, with a check to, uh, to help uh, restock the fish in the lakes. It's just, uh, it's just what our company's all about. The United Arizona Anglers Foundation, which is dedicated to improving warm water fishing in our state, not only contributed money to this project, but they also supplied the boats and manpower to distribute the fish among the lakes. We couldn't do this without the help of our volunteers. We can't be at three places at once, and the amount of manpower that they're, they're providing for us today, it's, it would have been impossible to do without, without their help. And they've kind of helped us through this process um, of, of obtaining the fish. They've, they've donated money, um, uh, which has been a big help in, in, in putting even more fish than we were originally going to put into it. Um, the manpower, um, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a, a, a big thanks to them and all the help that they've provided uh, to us. Since there are no local warm water hatcheries, these largemouth bass were trucked in 1,200 miles from the Inks Dam Hatchery in Burnett, Texas. Well, the, I guess the most interesting thing is, you know, it's a, it's a really a big responsibility because there's a lot of mouths in there that's got to be fed, taken care of to get to their destination for people to enjoy. After the fish arrived at the lake and were treated with the chemical bath to mark them, it was time to get them out of the truck and into the lakes. We'll give you one of the tubs, one of the cans, and then we'll put two cans on this boat and have them do probably fight site five, six, seven, eight, nine, or four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And if you guys want to do one, two, and three. Oh. Ron Schofield, an avid fisherman and volunteer, 
was happy to spend his evening helping to restock one of his favorite lakes, and he'd like to see more anglers become involved. I'm concerned about the lakes, otherwise I wouldn't be here. This is an opportunity for the average fisherman to help, and I'm here. Once the boats were loaded with their valuable cargo, they headed out across the lake. and into protective coves that will provide cover for the young fish. For anglers like Ron, helping to preserve the future of bass fishing in these lakes is a very rewarding experience. I know that we need the different age classes in the water. This is supplying one of the age classes. These hundred and some thousand little fish we dump today, while some of them will be food for bigger fish, there will be a lot of them that survive. It'll add another age class into this lake. Our job is getting done. It makes me feel really good at what we've done today. Thank you. And that's our show for tonight. If you'd like more information about anything you saw on the show, check out our website at azgfd.gov. On behalf of producers Carol Lind and Gary Schaefer, I'm your host, Jim Harkin. We'll see you next time.